Philippians chapter 2. We've been looking at the book of Philippians, and now we come to uh, what is one of the high points in all of Paul's letters and in all of the Bible, the, what's known as the Christ hymn in Philippians 2. Uh, a year and a half ago, I spent three, um, three weeks on this, and so uh, I thought about skipping it. Uh, and then I thought, no, I think I've got some more to say. And then I spent some time preparing, and then I wrote a, a sermon that came out to about an hour and 15 minutes. And so I've cut that down to an hour. Just kidding. You visitors. You know. <laughs> well, uh, hopefully we'll get it down. But there's just so much here. But before we look at it, let me, let me pray for us. God, we thank you for your word. Your word is truth and life. We thank you for the foolishness of the message preached, for in it you become present to us. We need to hear from Christ. We need to experience him. That word which brought about the first creation and which brings about new creation. Lord, whatever state we're in this morning, whether we believe in you or not, whether we're convinced of you or not, we all need you. And so I pray that you would make yourself present in a powerful and potent way to each of us here this morning. For Christ's sake, amen. Tell me a story. Tell me a story, Daddy. It starts early, our love for stories. And our kids don't have to tell us that it's not just a children's thing, it's a human thing. Uh, cultural anthropologists will show us that, that there has never been a society, and never been a culture uh, which, in which stories do not bind the people together and carry them along. From Beowulf to Gilgamesh. We are, as humans, a people of stories. We love stories. And the reason we love stories is because stories have the unrivaled power, the unrivaled power, to tap into our deepest emotions and our deepest desires. Uh, stories shape how we interact with the world. They shape how we view the world. Uh, stories shape what we expect out of the world. Vaclav Havel was the uh, first president of uh, the Czech Republic. And he was once asked, it, well, he made his name at first by being a playwright, and then that was what he was before he was a politician. And someone once asked him, how did the Velvet Revolution become so successful there in Czechoslovakia? And he answered, we had our parallel society. And in that parallel society, we wrote our plays and we sang our songs and read our poems until we knew the truth so well that we could go out into the streets of Prague and say, we don't believe your lies anymore. And communism had to fall. When Havel was asked, how was the revolution so successful? He said, we told our stories, and we told our stories, and we told our stories until they became a reality. See, stories are powerful. They have a profound power to shape how we view the world, how we experience the world, what we expect out of the world. So here's the question for all of us today. What story are you living by? I read an article this week by a sociologist talking about how Hollywood is having the most profound effect, the most profound effect, on Nigerian dress and ethics. The dress and ethics of Nigerian youth is shaped by Hollywood stories. What stories are you living by? Paul, the man who wrote this letter, the Philippians, the church to which he wrote it, they were not unfamiliar with the power of stories. In ancient Rome, drama, theater, plays, these things were all around. 
that theaters dotted ancient Rome and they were popular. As Caesar Augustus, the emperor who was, uh, who was the emperor when Jesus was born, he built a theater that could house 14,000 people. Can you believe that? 14,000 people, no electricity. And if you lived back in that day, you could go to the theater over 200 days a year, and it was free. Some rich patron would put on a show, and they would invite you out, and you could go. And what would you see when you went? Well, the most popular form of drama in that day was pantomime. What you would do is you would sit down, and the first thing you would do is you would hear a, a chorus, a choir singing a song. And then you would see an actor come out. That actor, through mask and gesture, would indicate that he was playing a character, a set of characters. And he wouldn't speak, no, he would, he would play the character as, uh, and play the story. He would enact it that was told in the song, the song called the libretto. Uh, there's an ancient physician named um, Galen, and he mentions how uh, he once diagnosed an upper-class uh, woman's illness as due to her infatuation with one of these actors. Not much has changed, huh? They were as starstruck then as we are today. It, Paul, the Philippians, they knew the power of stories. In fact, there's ample evidence to show that in the Roman world, people were so into stories that, and so into the theater that they started seeing life as a theater. And each person having a role to play in the drama of humanity. Well, in the verses that we come to today, particularly in Philippians 2, verse 6 through 11, we have what is known as the Christ hymn. As your Bible will show you in the way that it perhaps lays it out, these lines are highly structured in meter and rhyme. What Paul is giving us here is a poem, a hymn, a libretto. And this, this libretto tells a story. Paul's master story. And who is this? story about well it's a story about jesus look in verse five in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as christ jesus who it's a story about jesus paul will tell us about his status his disposition his actions look his status verse six he says that jesus was in very nature god now, some of your translations say form, and that's an actually, that's a very fine translation of the word, but it can be very confusing because it's not as if Jesus was the form of God insofar as he was some kind of imitation or, or uh, just a picture or a mere picture of God. No, he was the form insofar as he uh, was God's outward manifestation and glory. He possessed the glory and the qualities which make God God. He was in very nature God. We have to interpret this in light of what Paul goes on to say. And he did not consider equality with God. Something to be used for his own advantage. He was equal with God. Perhaps better, he did not consider this equality with God a thing to be used. See, he was, as the creed says, very God a very God. Or put it differently... Jesus is the man God became when God decided to become a man. That's what Christians believe. Jesus is the man that God became when God decided to become a man. You sit there and you say, well, wait, Kyle. Um, I'm here. I'm new. I'm just checking out Christianity. Why would God decide to become a man? Great question. And that leads us somewhat to the second thing Paul tells us about Jesus, and that is his disposition. He says in verse 6, being in very nature God, he did not consider equality with God 
That is this divine status, something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. That is, Jesus did not capitalize on his rank, his rights, his privileges. He did not use them to further himself, but he used them for others. This is his disposition. That he is deferential, self-sacrificial, self-giving. My grandfather had a lawn business, a very small lawn business. He cut the yards around his house in his retirement. But he invited me to go cut yards with him when I was about fifth grade to middle school. And every Friday I would go and I would spend the night with my grandfather and we would go out and we would cut the yards around my grandfather's house. I wasn't very good. Uh, I made a couple of bad mistakes that people got to look at for a couple of weeks, but he still paid me at the end and I got half the money and, and, um, and he took the other half. And that made sense. I mean, what didn't quite make sense, I didn't do half the work. But he he took his share, I took mine. But you know what I found out later? That the share that he took as his, he he saved up. He invested. And then he gave that share, which was rightfully his, to me when I went off to college. It was rightfully his. He had every right to use it for himself, for his own comfort, for his own advantage. But instead, he used it for me. That's just the kind of guy my grandfather was. Is. He's 94 now. This is... This is Jesus' disposition. One who gives himself, gives uses his rank, his rights, his privilege for others. And this disposition gets played out in actions. But verse 7 goes on to say that he made himself nothing or he emptied himself. That is, he did not consider equality with God, his, this divine status, something to be used for his own good advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing or he emptied himself. Now, when Paul uses the phrase, he made himself nothing or he emptied himself, he doesn't mean that he somehow uh, put off or divested himself of certain divine attributes. He, He doesn't even mean, I don't think, that he limited himself of the use of certain divine attributes. I don't think he means that at all. He was very God of very God. What does he mean? He means that he poured himself out. Like the suffering servant in Isaiah poured out his life for the sake of others. That's the imagery here. And how did he do it? Well, verse 7, taking the very nature of a servant, he became and being made in human likeness. Now, this isn't readily apparent to us, but Paul's language here is the same language that they would use in the theater. You see, Paul is saying that Jesus... The second person of the Trinity stepped onto the human stage and threw a mask and a gesture. He starts playing a role in the drama of humanity. And through his gestures, he is showing that he is in the likeness of someone. Who is he in the likeness? Whose part is he playing? Look, verse 8. He was found in appearance... Same word they used of actors. Found in in appearance as a man. Or, perhaps better, found in appearance as Adam. This is Paul's word for Adam often. It's the common word for man, but he uses the singular here. I think he's saying that Jesus, he stepped onto the human stage and He put on the mask of Adam, and he started playing Adam's part. There's only one male actor who has won the Academy Award three times, and that's Daniel Day-Lewis. And what makes Daniel Day-Lewis such a phenomenal actor is that he, 
embodies the characters that he plays. To such an extent that there's a melding between the identity of Daniel Day-Lewis and the identity of his characters. So, so for instance, uh, when, he, um, when he played a man with cerebral palsy in my left foot, he insisted to remain in a wheelchair, have people lift him around the set, and be fed through a spoon. Be f- spoon-fed. Uh, When he was in The Last of Mohicans, he would not eat food that he didn't kill, skin, and eat eat himself. True story. When he was in the name of my father, he locked himself in solitary confinement on the set. And for his last role, Lincoln, he kept that uh, Kentucky twang accent on and off the set, he had people who referred to him on and off the set as Mr. President, and he even responded in text messages, I don't know how Lincoln texts, but he would, he would respond in text messages to Sally Fields as, quote, Abe. Daniel Day-Lewis, he, he He so took on and embodied the character that there was this this melding where you you couldn't tell where his identity ended and the character's identity began. They started to meld. Well, in this drama, this libretto that Paul is telling, there is a melding between the identity of the actor God, the second person of the Trinity, and the character he is playing. You see, he becomes fully human. He so embodies the life of Adam that he takes on flesh and blood. He doesn't just appear as Adam, but he he becomes fully enfleshed so that he can play Adam's part. But note you, he plays this part in a very unique way. He doesn't mime Adam's disobedience. Look, verse 8. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. He doesn't mime Adam's disobedience. Do you see the contrast that Paul is trying to play here? It's, It's similar to the contrast that he plays out in Romans 5. Contrast between Adam and Christ. You see, whereas Adam did not have equality with God, where he was not in the same status or stature as God, he sought to usurp his position, to usurp the position of God himself, to take over. He wanted to be God. You will be like God, the serpent said. And Adam tried to be like God. Even though he wasn't God, he tried to be like God. Even though he wasn't God, he tried to usurp God. But Jesus, oh no. Even though he was God, very God of very God, he did not use that status, that privilege, that rank for his own advantage. No, he used it for the advantage of others. And in so doing, he became a servant, a slave. See, this is downward mobility. That is, that that when he took on Adam's role, he played Adam's part, not as Adam played it, but as Adam was meant to play it, as obedient. And he played it to the very end. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, the text says, even death on a cross. Kathleen Coleman, in her landmark study, shows how in the ancient world, in the theater, people started to have both a, a greater taste for realism in the theater and a greater taste for theater and drama in reality. So much so that these lines started to blur. And one of the ways in which you could see this is that on the stage, they started executing criminals. 
If the play called for someone to die, you know what they would do? They would constrict a convicted criminal and put that criminal in the role of that person who was supposed to die on the stage, and then that person would be killed in the audience, right before the audience during the play. If you were consigned to a, if you were cast in a criminal's role, that meant your sure death. So that was going on, on the one hand, inside the theater. But outside the theater, when they would actually punish criminals, they wanted to see it done with a bit of theatrics. And so one of the ways in which this is seen most clearly is in the punishment of crucifixion. You see, crucifixion was a dramatic, ironic retelling recasting of the criminal's crime. It it was, when someone was crucified, they might dress them up as a king, put a crown on their head, put a sign above them that said something like, the king, and then they would elevate them on a cross. And the whole point was to say, look who this person thinks he is. She is. The the whole point was that it it was reserved for runaway slaves or for enemies of the state. Those who had gotten above, according to those who were convicting them, their station in life. And, And this elevation of them was this ironic retelling of the crime to kind of say, look who he thinks he is. You know, Jesus was crucified. Why was Jesus crucified? Have you ever asked yourself that question? Why death on a cross? Why not drowned? Why not the guillotine? Why crucifixion? Why crucifixion when he was clearly not trying to usurp his authority? He had all authority in heaven and on earth. He couldn't usurp his authority. Why crucifixion? Because Jesus was playing a role. Jesus was taking on a part. Jesus was taking on a character. Whose character? Adam's character. And Adam, he did try to usurp his authority. He did try to surpass his station. He did try to become God. You see, Jesus, he was crucified because he played Adam's part, not by mimicking or miming Adam's disobedience, but by by playing the role to its destined end. Jesus was crucified for Adam's uppityness, for his pride, for his vainglory, and for yours and for mine as well. You see, he, he took our place. He played our part. He went all the way down for us and for our salvation. The story that this hymn tells is a story about Jesus, the divine actor who knew no sin, who plays humanity's role in this script, accepting the condemnation that is its necessary ending. And yet, and yet, because God is the author of this drama and the director of this play, Jesus' obedience was an obedience unto God. And so God, he reverses the ending. Look, verse 9. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name which is above every name. Jesus Christ, in Jesus, what happens is that that God replicates, he transforms, and he reverses humanity's story. Thou who art God beyond all praising, all for love's sake became as man, stooping so low but sinners raising, heavenwards by thine eternal plan. 
What story are you living by? What story is shaping your life? The way you view the world? What story has the most profound effect on the way you interact with the world and what you expect out of the world? Is it Paul's master story? What would it even look like to make the story our own? What would it even look like if this story was the story that controlled us? Well, the implications of Paul's master story are profuse and profound. And I'm only able to to tease out four this morning. But let me tell you the first. The first is this. This story must profoundly shape our view of Jesus. See, there's this popular idea out there. You've probably heard it. And that is this, that the idea, the confession that Jesus was God is kind of a late invention. Jesus didn't teach it. None of his earliest followers taught it. But actually, it was something that was um, invented by the early church a bit later on in order to gain some credibility. But but see, there's a problem with that. And here's the problem. Uh, The book that we're reading, the letter which this is written, Philippians, was written somewhere around about 20 years after Jesus' death. And remember, Paul here is quoting a hymn, a song, a popular hymn or song. And that means that the hymn or song predates the writing of the book, probably by a long shot. Uh, Why are you telling me that, Kyle? Why Why does that matter? It matters because of this. This confession that Jesus was in very nature God, it is early, early. It is actually at the heart and the core of early Christian confession. And in fact, everything stands or falls on this. But you see, if Jesus isn't God, if you're here and you don't think Jesus is God, then you should really just give up this Christianity thing. You should. Because... Because if he's not God, he can't save you. If he's not God, then he's just a a nearly perfect human being. Not a perfect human being, but a nearly perfect human being. Because he got some things about himself wrong, like the fact that he thought that he was God. But but maybe he is a model to emulate. And and if that's what you think you need, then then okay. But I don't know about you, but for any of us who have actually know the evil and sin and have been trapped by that in the world, then we know that we don't need a model to replicate. We need God come down. We need the creative power of God to bring about new life. That's what Jesus is that's who he is that's what he does see if he is god then that means everything and that means that you you have to follow him because all authority in heaven and on earth is given to him that means that his word is not advice it means that you have to stop scrutinizing him because he is the one who scrutinizes you and he commands our destinies you worship him This tells us something about Jesus, that he is God and that he is fully God, fully man. That he fully took on humanity. That he fully experienced our pain and our suffering. Luther said, no man feared death like this man. He felt it bodily. He felt it spiritually. He felt it in every way possible because his death was a death for sin. And he, can exper- and he has experienced it all for us and for our salvation. This, this story must profoundly shape how we view Jesus. Secondly, this story must profoundly shape our view of God. In John 1, 18, we read, No one has ever seen God. No one has ever seen God. But the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. You know, Christians believe that if you want to know what God is like, if you want to know God, if you want to know who God is, then you can't do better than to look at the face of Jesus. If you want to know God, then you look at Jesus, because he is a very God, verse 6. Jesus, who being in very nature God. But, but notice that the implications for this, as we come to Philippians 2, are actually quite profound, 
Look at verse 6 again. Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Uh, oftentimes that we, re- we read this text and we read this word being um, as if it means although. Although he was in very nature God, he didn't consider. And that's a quite fine reading of the text. That's a quite fine translation. And the meaning is there and it's fine and it's good. But because uh, there, there is a surprising way in which, which the God of the universe did not consider his, his status or use that to his own advantage, but divested himself. That he, that he poured himself out, that he was self-sacrificial. It's, it's surprising. But sometimes we read it as if Jesus was somehow acting in a character, uh, out, acting out of character as God, that he was acting in an ungodlike manner when he did this. And I want to suggest to you that that is not the case at all. That this word being, that we have to read into it, not only although, but also because. Because he was in very nature God. He did not consider equality of God something to be used for his own advantage. Because. In other words, that that Jesus' self-sacrificial, deferential, outpouring, self-emptying love was not an exception to his divinity. But it was the very manifestation and outworking of his divinity. Uh, let me, um, I, can, I can show you this uh, through looking at other places in Paul where Paul talks about himself in this way. When Paul talks about himself as an apostle in places like 1 Corinthians 9 and 1 Thessalonians 2, he talks about how as an apostle he had certain rights, like the right to marry or the right to uh, receive pay from someone. But he says that he, he, for, uh, he forewent, foregoes, foregone. I don't know. He <laughs> didn't use those rights. He didn't avail himself of those rights. He didn't push his weight around, but rather gave himself over in sac- self-sacrificial service to those churches. Now, here's the question. And he says, although I was an apostle and I could have done this and I had these rights, I didn't do it. Now, here's the question. Was Paul acting out of character when he did that as an apostle? Not in the least. He was very much acting in character. You you see, it wasn't wasn't that he was somehow acting out of character by not using these rights. Actually, he was acting in character. It was because he was an apostle, an apostle of the self-giving, self-sacrificial, crucified and resurrected Lord that he didn't use these rights to his own advantage. He was acting in character and not out of character in the same way when Jesus takes on flesh. When he, in self-effacing, sacrificial love, serves others. He is not acting out of character with God. He is acting in character as God. In other words, that he is not veiling his divinity, he is exposing his divinity. That, that, that the cross does not obscure God's wisdom and power, that the cross reveals God's wisdom and God's power. We sing veiled in flesh the God had see, but might I suggest to you that it's revealed in flesh the God had see, revealed and bruised and bloody in crucified flesh. That's where you see what God is like. That's where you see who God is. That's where you see his character. And here's what this means. If you want to see the beauty and the wisdom of God, then go see the babe born in Bethlehem. It means if you want to see God as high and lifted up, Meditate on the upper room discourse and look at a a Jewish man who strips down to the clothes of a slave and washes his disciples' feet. If you want to see power, strength, real strength, divine strength, then look to the marred man who is clipped to a tree on Calvary. 
This is where God reveals himself. This is where he reveals his glory most fully before our eyes. And it's foolishness to those who do not believe. That's what the Greek said. Moria, Paul. Foolishness. But to those of us who are being saved, we know it's the wisdom and the power of God. See, Jesus, he reveals who God is. Karl Barth, the Swiss theologian, said, We may believe that God can and must be uh, only be absolute in contrast to all that is relative, exalted in contrast to all that is lowly, active in contrast to all suffering, inviolable in contrast to all temptation, transcendent in contrast to all eminence, and therefore divine in contrast to everything human. In short, that he can and must only be holy other. Bart goes on. That's fa- Bart's favorite phrase for God, the holy other. But such beliefs are shown to be quite untenable and corrupt and pagan by the fact that God does, in fact, be and do all this in Jesus Christ. See, self-emptying, self-sacrifice, let me suggest to you that that is actually deference. It is at the heart of God. That God is eternally self-deferential. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit continually pouring himself out in service to one another. Some of you are here this morning and you believe that God is holding out on you. Most of us here this morning believe that in some way, shape, or form, God is holding out on us. Christian, do you not understand what this means? God cannot be holding out on you. It is, it is against his nature. His nature is to pour himself out for you in self-sacrifice, sacrificial service and love. That's who God is That's why we come here. Why do we come here on Sunday mornings? We come here so that we can serve God? Oh, yeah? Well, we come here so that the God of the universe, the transcendent one, who who is by his very nature service, can serve us. That's what the worship service is. That's what the table is. Is this where we commit to God? Yes. Is this where we remember God? Yes. But this is where he remembers us. And commits to us and feeds us. This is God and this is the God that we worship. And no other. See, if we have a view of God, we have a view of God where uh, where God uh, is glory is expressed and it's expressed not through service, not through sacrifice, not through self-giving, then that God is an idol. Because it's not the God revealed in the Bible. But this story has profound implications for our view of God. What story are you living by? This story has profound implications for our, our view and the shape of our, our need. Now, we played Adam's part. We mimicked Adam. Each and every one of us with despicable self-love and rage rebelled and fell under the curse. We disturbed a punishment that corresponds to the uppiness and to the arrogance that was ours. And, and that simply means this. The wages of our sin is not simply death. The wages of our sin is a cross, a public spectacle of our cosmic treason. And so if we, if, we, if we die in the bed quietly, that is a mercy. See, if Jesus was willing to take on flesh to, to humble himself and to go to the point of being lifted up on the scaffold of a cross for you and for me, then it only says one thing. If he did that for us, it's because we needed it. That's how bad our situation was. Do you believe that? Uh, This story has profound uh, impact on how we view our need. The second thing, this this story must profound, or the fourth thing, excuse me, this story must profoundly shape how we view the life of faith. When, When Jesus, through this hymn, when Jesus comes and plays out Adam's story, we not only see what God is truly like, we also see what Adam or humanity should have been like. 
And by uniting us to himself in salvation, this is what Jesus has made possible for us. The church father Irenaeus said that the Lord Jesus Christ did through his transcendent love become what we are, that he might bring us to be even what he is himself. Look at verse 5. This is how Paul heads this whole thing off. He says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ or Christ Jesus. Or perhaps a better translation. In your relationships with one another, think in a way that is appropriate for those in union with Christ Jesus. Uh, Paul, Paul is saying, you are in union with Christ. And what does it mean to live out your union with Christ? Well, it means this that we look at the way God came and imitated us and we imitate him imitating us. But this is God imitating us and Paul's calls to imitate God imitating us. And in this, through self-sacrificial, deferential love of others, we become like Jesus and in so doing become like God and in so doing, experience our salvation. The songwriter Joni Mitchell has this uh, great song on her album, Blue, and this line that says, I hate you some, I hate you some, you know, I love you some. I said, I love you when I forget about me. Now that characterizes my life and all my relationships. I hate you some, I hate you some, I love you some. I love you when I forget about me. I love you when I'm pouring myself out for you and not thinking of me. You know what I think about that song? I think about it when there's a bunch of dishes out and I start thinking about me. I, I think about it when I'm not getting the praise that I deserve think I deserve or should have or someone's not respecting me in the way that they should. I, th I think about it when, uh, when the baby's crying in the middle of the night. I think about it in these times. Because in those times, I realize that I'm not loving because I'm thinking about me. But the call is that we would love, and to love is to not think about me. It's to forget about me. And to live a life like this, a live a life of deferential, self-giving, self-sacrificial love, if we live that life, then that life is, is an outworking of faith. Because uh, that life will require a radical dependence on God. Just like Jesus' life was marked by a radical dependence on God. I want you to know some, notice something. That once we get to verse 9, Jesus is no longer the subject. Jesus does all these things. He empties himself. He humbles himself. He takes on flesh. But when we get to, he pours his life out unto death, but, and is obedient unto death. But when we get to verse 9, the subject changes. Jesus is no longer the subject. Jesus is the object. The object of who? Of God's power to rescue him from the dead. That's what faith looks like. Faith looks like giving yourself in, over, in, in obedience to God and leaving it to God for the consequences. And even if that means obedience unto death, and that means you trust God to raise you from the dead. This is faith. So what story are you living in? My, my concern, as I look at myself, to be honest, as I look at the American church, even as I look at our church, my concern is that we're living by a different story. My concern is that I'm living by a different story. Because what I notice in myself is that my obedience ends where discomfort and danger, lack of health, begin. Mighty obedience is not an obedience all the way unto death. It's certainly not obedience there because it's not an obedience to discomfort. And that, that my entire life, or much of it, is, is actually trying to better my situation. And all the decisions that I make are based on that. And I wonder, what, 
story is controlling me? And how much do I lack faith? A faith in a God who raises the dead. See, what we are called to, Christian, is the cruciform love of Jesus, where we take up our crosses and we follow him. Self-protection is not a Christian virtue. Self-defense is not a Christian virtue. We take up our cross and we follow him all the way to the grave. And if we baptized our children, then I'm sorry if I didn't tell you this before, but we baptized them into that life. And we follow him wherever he leads us into discomfort, even into death. Trusting in the God who raises the dead. Because Jesus here, he shows us uh, not just a, a model for how to be human, but he, he shows us the way of God's dealing with opposition. That God loves his enemies to death, even death on a cross. He loved you to death. While we were enemies, Christ died for us. He loved me to death. That we might love others to death and leave our lives to the resurrecting power of God. Amen. Lord, I pray that you would enable us to love you as you have loved us, to forget about ourselves and pour our lives out for others, for Christ's sake. Amen.